Okay, so I think we got started now. Um, welcome to my talk. Um, uh, today I'm going to talk to you about um, PTP and how to verify it in the real world. Um, I will add some failure modes you might encounter if you um, deploy it in the real world and we will have a look at it and yeah, basically I'm Johannes. Uh, on most social networks, I'm known as Dickenhobelix. I'm a former systems engineer. I worked in the field for like 10 to 15 years, how, depending on how you define working in the field. And by now, I'm working at Pengotronics, a Linux consulting company in Hildesheim, northern Germany. And I'm working there as a senior kernel developer. Um, small disclaimer, this talk may conf contain some profanity, so... Um, if you're offended by that, you may leave now. Um, Rocky Horror is, of course, about interaction, so I want you to get uh, interactive with me, and um, there will be a common thing, and I will ask you to always check your assumptions, and when we get to that, I want you to repeat after me that you also check your assumptions. So when we get to that, uh, we will try that out, and we will, uh, I will ask you to repeat after me. I hope that goes, goes well. Um, this talk is about my personal experience when setting up P2P for our customers. So your mileage may vary, um, especially if you work on other hardware than like ARM boards or other hardware than embedded SOCs. Um, so there might be maybe some difference in your experience and the last disclaimer, this talk has been prepared with Linux PTP version 3.1. By now, version 4 is, has been released, and I have not had a chance to port that talk to Linux PTP version 4. But I have been told that uh, stability and stuff has improved a lot since then, so you may want to try that out yourself. Now, first of all, we're going to look um, I give you a brief introduction to what PTP is and what PTP does. We will have a short look on which kernel components and user space components are involved. We will talk about different measurement methods um, you can use to verify if your setup actually works and works as intended. Then I have a lot of examples brought with me and we will look into common pitfalls, best practices, and I hope that we still have time for lots of Q&A afterwards. So, what do we do with PTP? The basic idea is we have multiple clocks in different SOCs, different computers, and we want to synchronize them, and we don't want to synchronize them uh, with like a line we pull or with a pin we toggle, but we want to synchronize them over network. We want to auto-select the best possible clock reference in, in the network, and we want to compensate for path delays because um, as you see in that picture down there, we have like queuing in different bridges in the network. We have um, path delays between those different nodes in the network, and we need to compensate for that. Um, and the way we do this is with uh, a mechanism called um, two-step sync. We can employ, basically we send out a sync packet we timestamp that, uh, that packet, that's where this T1 timestamp is recorded in hardware, if ever possible, and we send that timestamp um, to our follower clock, so that's the secondary clock that is to be synced to the leader clock, and we answer with a delay request, and of course that delay request uh, is recorded, or the receive timestamp is recorded and send in a delay response. And I tried to, uh, in that blue box, I tried to recall which timestamps are known to the follower clock at a certain point in time. If you follow through and there's those nice formula, I, that's the only math we're gonna encounter in that talk. Um, and you can actually calculate the delay and the offset of those two different clocks and you can use that for compensating for, of course, the path delay and for uh, the clock's offsets. And you can use that to uh, calculate from the sync uh, point in time and to um, basically retune your clock or calculate the clock offsets of leader and follower. 
that's the basic idea of how you do PTP, and that's the basic idea of how basically any time synchronization protocol in the world works. Um, for the selection of the best leader clock, the basic idea is to um, announce capabilities that like clock quality, if you're running from a crystal, if you're running from like an atomic clock or a rubidium reference, and to ha also have like some user configurable stuff because you may want to use a central entity in your network as a reference clock that won't go away and maybe skip a clock that is in the perif uh, periphery of your entire network um, because, well, it may be unplugged and then you have to re-elect the best master clock or uh, a leader clock. Um, and there's also like some tiebreakers if you have uh, different clocks of the same class. And the idea is basically if you want to become a, a leader clock or if your system says it um, thinks it's a good leader clock, it will announce that to the network and then this algorithm runs that yeah, basically selects um, the best leader clock there. That's in a nutshell how PTP works. But there's a catch to that because there's like a lot of different uh, variants of how stuff works. There's first of all the question of how your bridge, basically in most cases that's a network switch, uh, works. There's like a boundary clock which uh, runs like one of those two-step syncs we saw earlier between each of its uh, neighbor or, or to each of its neighbors. There's like a transparent clock where you don't run a separate sync uh, to your neighbor clock, but you instead um, compensate for queuing delays within the bridge. So if the bridge knows how long the packet, how long it takes for the packet to travel through the bridge, it can actually um, use a field in the, in the message to compensate for that. Or you can have an ordinary clock, which is basically the worst implementation. Uh, you just ignore queuing delays. Um, some of the different PTP profiles only allow for a certain type of uh, bridge. For example, if you look at um, 802.1as, that's the TSM version of PTP, GPTP, it only allows, allows for boundary clocks, so each switch has actually to um, run a synchronization to each of its neighbors. So that may differ a lot between uh, different versions and de it strongly depends on your application profile and on the requirements for that application profile. Um, the same is true for the sync type. We saw the two-step sync. It's called two-step sync because we send like the two messages. Um, um, you see those two sync and follow-up messages there. And you could theoretically um, include the timestamp T1 into that sync packet if you have like special hardware that can inject the timestamp within the packet at the point of time where it's sent. It's basically a mess. It never really worked, especially for faster than 100 megabit. So for gigabit Ethernet or for even faster line rates, it actually never worked. And it's usually not recommended to use one-step sync, but it's uh, possible for some of the profiles in theory. Um, the same is true for the transport layer. You have like layer three implementation. So um, basically in UDP packets, and you have um, layer two, that's the way uh, TSM does stuff because it's a layer two protocol suite. Um, so it does us in um, raw Ethernet packets, basically with a special Ether type. You can have different ways of delay measurement. You can measure between different points in the network and measure point to point, uh, or you can measure your delay end to end. So uh, from one, leaf node of your graph in the network to the entire different end and compensate over the entire path or uh, as I said you can compensate for different path delays within certain sub paths of the network. 
And of course, as with every protocol, there's like lots of extensions for redundancy, for special applications, for whatever you can think of for security, whatever. We will ignore that part for this talk, but be aware that different profiles can change the behavior of the system a lot and they're usually incompatible to each other. For how PTP is implemented in Linux, there's a general abstraction in um, the PTP hardware clock that basically just describes a abstract clock that can be tuned. And this is usually used with um, hardware offloaded packet timestamping. Most of the time you use the hardware offloaded version because it um, gives much better performance. And usually, um, Ethernet Max nowadays have support for actually telling you when a packet is sent or received. And um, they usually use that uh, PTP hardware clock abstraction. I put the uh, documentation links in, in the presentation so you can read uh, in the kernel docs if you're interested in how that is implemented and how the, the abstraction looks exactly. Um, the closer, the general rule of thumb is the closer to the actual wire you do your timestamping, the more precise you can, uh, uh, the more precision in your time, uh, time synchronization you can achieve. That's a general rule of thumb. Um, the more interesting part from my point of view, because there's more variation to it, um, is the user space and the most common project used there. And, um, yeah, it's, it's Linux PTP. Um, it's quite well established and actually quite well maintained. It's, it's quite an active project. It supports lots of different profiles as long as they don't interfere with the baseline implementation. It's quite tricky to configure. It uses config files and also command line. You can also pass lots of command line parameters. And sadly, it doesn't always check for consistency over all parameters. And it's quite hard to get it right and it sometimes won't tell you if you have like an incompatible configuration and it will just fail to synchronize. Um, by now, they release quarterly um, until version four. They had like once in a blue moon release schemes. I think the version three or something was released like three years ago. And I'd re usually recommend to go to a new version because they tend to fix quite a lot of issues and to also uh, support like um, newer versions of the synchronization um, protocols like the latest PTP versions. Um, by now, I just recommend to go to the quarterly releases probably or just pick master if you will. Um, there's also some other projects um, like PTPD or like the Excel 4 stack. I strongly recommend to stay away from these because they're usually not well maintained or only cover small subsets of profiles. And often that's like, in our company, we call it industry code quality. It's quite a bit bad. Well, that's the part of which parts we need to um, put together. And now we come to the, the measurement part. So how can we measure if two systems are actually synchronized? And the most obvious way of doing that is basically just generating pulse outputs um, on each second, for example. Usually they are called pulse per second outputs, or PPS for short. And just hook them up to an oscilloscope or a time domain analyzer or whatever measurement equipment you've got and uh, compare the edges if they match up. And uh, you really want to observe that output over a longer period of time. That's quite important because, um, well, you want to make sure that you don't have like jitter over time or wander over time or systems drift apart. There's also other meth uh, measurement meth uh, methods like reverse sync, where the leader clock sends back a sync, uh, sync message to the leader um, that needs support in the uh, leader clock stack. It usually tends to work quite well, but you should really um, verify with like uh, one of the pulse per second outputs that your sync output you measure is actually what you think you measure. And 
that's where the interactive part comes in. So I want you to shout as loud as you can. Um, always check your assumptions now at this point in time, and we'll try that on the count of three. So one, two, three. Always check your assumptions. You're great. You're the best. Um, so that's the first thing I learned when I work with that reverse sync method because I thought, well, that looks really nice. Well, it didn't. And you really want to check that your measurement system is not um, fooling you, basically. The same is true for the ingress and the egress measurement methods where you observe your local clock. So every system basically has a quartz crystal or something that you derive your clocks from. And you can observe the incoming sync packages and watch if they drift apart and how fast they drift apart. And if you have like a high quality local clock, uh, you can compare it to the incoming sync messages and you can check if like there's a linear regression or how they, the different systems behave. And the same holds true. So one, two, three. Always check your assumptions. That's good. That's great. Um, yeah. So um, Murphy's law is very strong if you set up PTP. And it becomes even worse because you have that many permutations in that and in the, in the different um, sub-settings. And it's, I, I will show you some of the mistakes I made in the past. Um, that's not at all exhaustive. And you really want to make sure that your measurement setup is set up well and that you can actually measure sync. And I'd also strongly recommend you add like plausibility checks. What do I mean by plausibility checks? Uh, you're sending times over your network and you can actually make use of that and not only check that every, every sync pulse you measure is the right one or, or that they align in your oscilloscope, but also you could like check if the, to if, the, if the absolute time of day you send over the network matches what you expect to be sent. And I think in the next slide, I will show you my measurement setup, which will make it quite obvious what, what, I, um, what I mean with that. And of course, always check your assumptions, right? Um, so we have like a GNSS receiver, that's a microblocks, whatever GPS receiver, and we feed the pulse per second and the absolute time of day in the PPS capture. And we use that to tune the PTP hardware clock and we send, the, uh, we send that time over to a device under test and we generate a pulse per second output from that and we compare that on an oscilloscope. So I said the GPS has like a time of day. You really want to make sure that your device under test has the same time of day synced um, or syncs to the time of day you set in your reference system or you received in your reference system because um, it didn't always in my case. And you may have some strange issues there where for example, your uh, PPS capture may be wrong or your GPS may not work and you just send over your local whatever clock and you really want to make sure that because we measure like the PPS output um, that you actually measure PPS output that has, that has been captured by your leader clock, right? So um, how does that look like? We have an example measurement here. I hooked up the oscilloscope as I showed you and I uh, hooked it up to well, a cheapish scope, but uh, it'll do for, for that example. And uh, please um, check the time scale. I circled it in red. Um, that's what you will ex expect for a system that isn't tuned too well, but is syncing okay-ish. I run the test for like over three hours. I um, basically pumped the persistence of, of my scope to infinity. And I observed like normally distributed excursions. So of course there's like a control loop running that synchronizes your hardware clock. That's what you'd ex expect for, for a not too well tuned, but for an out of the box system more or less. And yeah, we have, we have that uh, blue trace. That's the reference clock. 
and the yellow one is the device on the test. And we will look into some failure modes I encountered. You really want to make sure to run your measurement over a longer period of time because, well, you may lose sync within that period or something. You want to make sure you capture those failure, uh, failure events and make sure that you're actually synchronized and stable. And basically that's, that's what we did. In this case, you also want to make sure to like run your device on the test through several temperature cycles to make clocks drift if they weren't synchronized for some reason because that could fool you that quartz crystals are quite good in keeping like uh, semi sync because they're, they're, they're quite small and tolerant, so you can easily get fooled. Now, that's an un unsynchronized system. Basically, we just have like a random clock running through. And in this case, my, uh, my synchronized uh, signal wasn't captured. My setup on my leader clock was basically, I, I misconfigured the leader clock. Uh, the same would hold if you had a link issue. Basically, the systems can't talk to each other if you have incompatible settings. There's a lot of um, reasons why a system could look like that. In this case, my link capture, uh, my reference signal capture failed. What we see here is a quite large time offset. We have 10 milliseconds per division, so it's quite uh, four, 40 milliseconds here. And the issues, if you have that large of an offset, is that you can zoom in. And um, even if your system has deviations and is not synchronized, um, the offset and the wonder that's generated by each measurement is so small, you probably won't observe it. So basically, you don't know if that's synchronized. So it's, it's not synchronized. The, the, the signals do not overlap. But um, they could have the same frequency, basically. But you don't know. Um, in this case, the, the device under test is running ahead of um, our reference time. And actually, they didn't drift apart. And it was an issue in, in the hard, in, in the driver that failed to um, set the absolute, uh, absolute point in time where the rising edge was generated. Could also be an issue with time scale. You have to keep in mind that GPS uses a different time scale than UTC. And other GNSS systems have completely different time scales. Like uh, the Russian one uses like Moscow wall clock time for whatever reason. And depending on your reference time source, that may, may introduce quite some uh, issues in your system. You also have some systems where the delay that is measured in hardware is overcompensated. There is some Intel drivers that are famous for doing that. Um, or your hardware clock may, bro may be broken. There's, there's quite a lot of reasons, but we see in that, or in, the, in that, this case, we see that um, we actually are ahead of time of our reference signal, and that's very, very unlikely for transfer signal. Um, in this case, we have like an a asymmetric uh, distribution of our error. I didn't measure for a very long time. Uh, in this case, it was ca uh, caused by a bad uh, energy efficient Ethernet setting. Um, I'm not entirely sure why it is wrong, but um, the EEE did influence the uh, time stamping in some kind, in some weird way. I'm not a hardware engineer, I don't know why it is wrong exactly, but it influenced my measurement. You could, if it's constant, and if you qualify that it's constant, you could compensate for that but I'm not the one to ask about why exactly it is wrong. Maybe some power gating clocks are different, whatever. Um, in this case, you see that we completely lost sync for a moment, and we had like the clock drift away for, for some time and then gaining sync again. So if you only did like a temporary measurement, it would look quite, quite okay. And in this case, our leader clock missed a transmission interrupt, which is a problem, especially with some Intel cards. And there's actually like a Linux PTP um, 
option that you can make your system a bit more resilient about. And yeah, I didn't use that in this case. So we missed a timestamp and the system got out of sync. It, the, the clock was speeding up a bit, so the, 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 the edges were traveling left. And after some back of time uh, with the error mode, we just regained synchronization and the clock tuned back. So in this case, you only see this failure mode if you record over a longer period of time. Um, if you permanently lose your sync, of course, you will drift apart over a longer period of time. Um, in this case, it didn't drift much. That's only like several hundred nanoseconds uh, because I had a thermally stable system and the clocks were quite well synced before we uh, lost our synchronization. So that's how this basically looks like. So you drift apart, uh, you might also drift back a bit, depending on your power supplies and thermal, thermal effects. Now, how does it look if we look into the log files? Because that's what we usually see if we look at software. For at least layer two transport, it looks pretty much like this. We have like a start where a negative delay is indicated. And that's basically because this, the clocks are out of sync and some weir weird startup things are going on. We can safely ignore that if, if that's only a transient startup. And then basically we just start and that's more or less how it will look. And we have like a delay of 300-ish nanoseconds and we see that our frequency is a bit apart. That's what we'd expect. That's why we do a synchronization because our clocks are running at different speeds. Note that the output will look different for layer three transports. Um, and yeah, let's look at failure modes because that's what we're here for. Um, if we lose sync, that's usually quite a unique pattern that we can scan for. We see master sync timeout. So the master clock, um, doesn't send us any synchronization and we I configured my system to never be or my leader to my device on the test to never become master So it just loses synchronization and it backs off. That's basically how that looks like um, I did a little different uh, setup and uh, I used some bridges and I changed one of the links while running to half duplex now, if we run a half, du du uh, half duplex link, um, the halfway timestamping won't work anymore because, of course, we have like errors and we can't actually tell if our timestamp belongs to a successfully sent frame or to a frame that has a collision. So, the standard forbids that, uh, to, for, or forbids to run on that, and it will basically look something like that ish. Um, but it's very hard to tell apart from uh, a complete loss of sync because, well, we cut a cable or something like that. And that's, that is a pattern that we, you will encounter a lot. Um, it's quite hard to tell the different failure modes apart from logs only. Um, if we start on a half duplex link, it will look a bit different. Um, we just have like a fault detected and it backs off. Um, and won't, won't start at all. Um, in this case, we see that we measure a peer delay of like 1700 um, nanoseconds and there's a part in the standard for GPTP, that's the TSM version, um, that forbids links with large and 800 nanoseconds um, delay. And that's basically what, how we detect that our peer isn't capable of doing that special version of PTP, and it just bails out and loses uh, its, its power or its membership in the synchronization domain, and we have an entire loss of sync. In this case, it was caused by um, an incomplete driver and a hardware bug for, Basically, the driver was well tested for gigabit Ethernet, but it was not tested at all for 100 megabit, and I will probably fix that next week or so. Um, 
but that's how math looks and it's quite hard to see the correct line if you don't know where to look at. Um, I told you about the, the, the leader clock that uh, missed its uh, TX timestamp interrupt. That's a problem um, mainly caused by the hardware design of some uh, network interfaces and how uh, the fact how stuff is communicated in there. Um, you have like for the receive part, it's quite easy because you receive a packet, you take the timestamp out of the corresponding register, clear the interrupt flag, and you hand it over via um, ancillary an ancillary message in your SKB, basically. And for TX, it's much harder because you have to communicate back to the error queue and you have a small window of time when you can do that before the SKBs are discarded. And if for some reason the NIC fails to raise the interrupt at the right point in time, um, you may miss your interrupt or it may be delayed for some reason, some other interrupts going on. And if Linux PTP fails to capture the interrupt or can't read it from the error queue, that's the way how it is communicated back, um, it will basically go in a fault state and will back off for several seconds and will not synchronize or start resynchronization for several seconds. And basically that's the line you want to scan for and there is an option you can set to make that more resilient. So some common pitfalls. I promised you in the title that we do a time warp. If you have like different sources for synchronization in your system, like NTP for example, you may encounter a difference uh, time scales, different reference point in times where system time jumps. And if you synchronize your hardware clock to your system time, that is quite a bad thing and um, will basically break your PTP. Um, we talked a bit about PTP profiles. Um, we may have uh, missing incomplete or defective timestamping support in hardware or drivers. Never rely on the data sheets. That's really, really bad because Vendors will always tell you that they support any different or any available mode. They usually don't, and they haven't qualified for any of them or not for some very uncommon ones. You should do your measurements yourself. Um, you may encounter differences uh, depending on whether you time them in the Mac or in the Fi. And uh, yeah, as I told you, the hardware often only supports a, diff a subset of one step, two step sync, layer two, layer three, point to point, end to end. Um, and you will ha have to choose your hardware depending on what profiles you need in, in your um, application. I talked about time scales. You have different offsets, sleep seconds, whatever. You have sometimes false positive debug output. You may encounter issues with demon stabilities. Um, your daemon may die and you may not notice if you are not using like system D and check-in and restarting stuff. Um, your measurement method, uh, for the measurement method, you have to choose if you like run one pulse per second or like 100 pulses per second. With more pulses, you usually have like a better measurement because you take more samples over time, but you can only like um, detect errors up to a hundredth of a second because then you will roll over. And if you have like a larger delay, you won't notice. So you will probably want to check both of them. You may have sporadic dropouts. That's the TX timestamp timeout option you want to set, especially if you're working with like uh, Intel i 10 ish cards. Um, you want to check if you're leader clock is actually on the device you expect your leader clock to be on and on the device that you actually uh, have your reference time input and never rely on data sheets, measure yourself. So for the best practices, um, choose the correct profile. Often you need to select one depending on the application. If you do TSN, that's the GPTP one. If you do like power substation automation, crazy stuff, whatever, they have their own um, profiles. So check if your hardware actually supports that. 
never copy paste commands from the internet. There's, they may f use a different profile or may use an, a, a combination of settings that's incompatible by now, nowadays with a newer version. Um, read the fine man pages. Um, check hardware clock av availability, check if it's stable. Um, read your logs. Um, especially logs and bridges are quite a valuable tool for debugging because you can check what exactly goes wrong if your offsets, if your peer delays drift apart. It usually gives a good hint what goes wrong. Um, again, read the man pages, they're quite good and thoroughly test over a longer period of time. And of course, last point, let's check your assumptions. <laughs> You're great. So, PTV can work great if done right, it has lots of parameters, and your mileage may vary. Basically, that's anything from my point. If you want to work more with those fine things and want to be paid for doing that, we're hiring. And do you have any questions? I can see with the scope that you can see the clocks synchronized, but how do you tell that they both have the same time of day? Sorry, could you speak up a bit? Yeah, how do you tell that they both have the same time of day? I mean... Um, basically, you can just read out the absolute value of the clock and compare if there are the same values within a certain reasonable margin. So if they're like less than a second apart, you could say tell um, that they are probably reasonably synced if you just run like time date control or whatever uh, on both machines and check if they have like a reasonable close value. That's usually the way I do it. You can get if they're like one is epoch and the other is like today. I'm wondering for PTP, does it work over a complex uh, network layout with many different switches, routers, these kind of things? Uh, I don't know, to be honest. So in your test, it's basically point-to-point -point connection. Um, I, I did some testing with switches, um, though I only tested for some profiles. Okay. So it, it, you can say it's actually dependent on hardware uh, vendor as well for those. Uh... Yes, because they need to interfere, especially for boundary clocks where the clock or where the switch takes part in the interaction. Um, and they often only support a certain type of clock. So for the switches I use, that's usually like the, P, uh, the, the TSM version. Um, they probably won't do like the power substation profiles and that will vary a lot uh, depending on your on your vendor and your switch system you use okay thank you did you ever work with uh, ethercat from Beckhoff? yes uh, would that be a nice option for having a reference clock test so you have both from your clock source running out on the ethercat device and get giving timestamps for pbs and whatever for testing um Probably not so much because the way Ethercat works is it bypasses um, basically Ethernet and uses just the physical layer. And the way Ethercat timing works is um, to offload precision from the, from the um, master. Um, they reclock the packets in the first slave. So from the first slave on, stuff is probably okay to, or, or it would be probably okay to reuse the, um, the, the regenerated clock from the slaves. But if you compare the master system to the first follow, for example, you may encounter some offsets because they actually regenerate the clock from the packet flow. So depending on your hardware setup, might work.
Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, in, in recent uh, Wi-Fi standards, there is uh, also some time synchronization um, intended, uh, mostly intended for uh, multi-room uh, speakers. Um, do you know something about how this could, or how PTP or time synchronization could benefit from these? To be honest, I haven't looked too deep into that. Um, but you have like a different situation because you have, first of all, links with negligible um, path delay because propagation is more or less with, with the speed of light. And um, you have an entire different situation because you have a shared medium. So you have to make sure that you don't have like interfering um, synchronization pulses but I haven't looked too deep into that. If you want to fund such work, I'd be happy to look into more and deeper into that. Insert money here. Hello. Can you, take, uh, can you tell us some more about the hardware you used for your measurements and if you had take care on uh, adjusting the high delay compensation? Yeah, sure. Um, basically, as a reference clock, I used a microblocks GPS receiver that generates a PPS output and via serial link a, um, a time of day, an NMEAA string. Um, that's okay within a certain reasonable yeah, precision. And I captured that at an Intel, basically standard PC box uh, with a E210. And with a separate E210, I generated um, the master clock reference. And I connected that to a follower device that used an IMX8 MP, which has support for regenerating PPS from its timestamping clock. And yeah, basically that's a measurement setup. I had like different switches uh, in, in the middle to also check with switches. Um, one of the more hackable ones, which is reasonably priced and has quite good software support is um, from Contron, which is an industrial switch, D10, I think it's called. And it's not too expensive and you can access quite a lot of measurements, which is always nice as a debugging tool. Um, yeah, basically then I hooked up my oscilloscope and whatever and checked that. And I will actually look into the delay measurement of my Phi and uh, the Mac in the next few days. And um, the Mac actually should report, uh, the Phi should actually report in its extended registers what its delay is. But I have still have to verify that. We're actually at time. Thank you. Thank you.